Hey, welcome to the specialization introduction to robotics. This is the first part, basic behaviors and odometry. And this is the first lecture. About me, I studied electrical engineering in Munich and Zurich and got my PhD in computer science in Lausanne at EPFL. You see this here in the bottom right. I'm a faculty at the University of Colorado since 2009. From 2016 and 2022, I ran a startup selling robotic hands and industrial automation equipment, um, as well as software to optimize workflows. And at the university, I do research on robotics manipulation and robotic materials. What is a robot? This is probably the first question you should ask when taking this class. Very early on, we've seen things that operate magically, like opening a door when people stand in front of it. And uh, this was the phantom doorman. Now the question is, is this a robot? It has sensors that senses the people, it has actuation that opens the doors, and it even makes basic decisions such as open the door when somebody's in front and then closing the door a little later. Uh, this is probably not a robot, but something like this is clearly a robot uh, because it has goggly eyes. No, I'm kidding. Um, once things are anthropomorphized, we tend to attribute them to be a robot more likely. But and this is, of course, not more a robot than that. It really depends on what is going on inside, and we will talk more about that today. We also now have cars, which you might call robots, because they drive by themselves. Um, we have very simple vehicles that can avoid and follow the light, just like bacteria, which you might consider robots. And you have dishwashers and other kitchen automation equipment, like espresso machines, which are maybe robots um, because they do have computers, they do have actuators, and they do have sensors. Now, another form of robots are, of course, entertainment robots. You all know C-3PO um, and R2-D2, and these are characters from Westworld um, where the robot really is something that looks as human as possible. When you go to the internet and Google um, what other universities put out there, you might find a sentence like this from the University of Southern California, which says that a robot is a system which exists in the physical world and autonomously senses its environment and acts in it. Oxford University says, Robotics is the intelligent connection of perception to action. And Rodney Brooks, when he was at MIT, said, a robot is an autonomous machine capable of sensing its environment, carrying out computations to make decisions and performing actions in the real world outside of its body. Now you might go back and think about whether a dishwasher fits these categories or a little educational robotic system like the Sparky robot or what else is needed. So first, we need to sense the environment. We have some form of sensing in each of these senses, uh, in these sentences. Uh, the first one is sensing the environment. The second one uses the word perception. And the third one just says sensing. So it has to sense something. And then the other two here mentioned something like intelligent connections or computation. Now here, the word that you see is autonomous, which is a little more complicated, but it means the same thing. And finally, we have the word action. So it has to do something. Now back to the dishwasher. Is the dishwasher intelligent? No. Uh, does it sense very much? Not really. Is the door sensing something? Yes. Is it acting? Yes. Is it intelligent? Maybe not. So. What a robot is, is probably still vague, but it has to do with something that involves intelligence. Now, Rodney Brooks has another statement, which he adds, which is outside of its body. With that, he tries to exclude computers, and it has to do something 
that is not happening within the machine. So the dishwasher is not really a robot, the espresso maker is not really a robot, but it's something that has to happen outside of the embodiment of this machine. Now I programmed an example in WeBots, the simulator we will use in this class. And this robot is driving on a chessboard and not falling off the edges. Now, uh, of course, this is just a simulator, but I do have the same um, mechanism as a wind-up toy. And I can run it on a table and it exhibits the same behavior, behavior without any electronics. Now, let's watch this again. Can this be, can something be as intelligent if you want to detect edges and then decide to turn just using uh, the mechanism alone? The answer is yes. In this work case, you have a little caster wheel here in front, which can get off the edge. And then there's another wheel, which you can barely see right now here, which is turning orthogonally to the direction of motion. And as the caster wheel loses contact, this side wheel will touch the ground and spin the robot around like that. The caster wheel gets back up onto the chessboard. The side wheel is lifted again and the robot keeps driving straight. So then you see that the mechanism is actually very important in designing a physically embodied system. And we maybe should put forward a, a definition like this. What is a robot? A robot is a physically embodied, artificially intelligent agent that is capable of sensing, planning and affecting the physical world. When you look back, back in history, you will find the first use of the word robot in a play by Karel Chapek in the 1920s, uh, which was called Rossum's Universal Robot. And you see here a bunch of people that are dressing up as mechanical figurines and exhibiting mechanical motions. They are workers that help uh, the people um, and the word robota means forced labor. The idea of having such forced labor is much older. It starts with the Colossus of Rhodes, 1000 before Christ, where people installed a statue that was supposed to protect an island and it's more mythological in nature. But then we got early automata already 100 AD. And this case is um, a mechanism that can dispense holy water. You have to put a coin on top. There's apparently some weighing mechanism that then unlocks a mechanism and dispenses some of the holy water. People pushed automata forward. And you see here a mechanical line that has been designed by Leonardo da Vinci. And for, let's say, 200 years, this has been the rave in European courts and other very rich people who have constructed mechanisms like this from silver, could drive around on a table and even uh, spun off an arrow or something sophisticated like this after they reached a goal. And then people on the table had to do uh, drinking, whoever was hit by the arrow, things like that. Um, and so it goes through history till George Deval invented the first industrial robot in 1961. And you can see this here. Uh, let's play that movie. This is a release from 1961. A robot for industry. And this is it, Unimate, a machine that can reach out to seven feet and perform a multitude of tasks in factory or laboratory as skillfully as a man, but without getting tired. It's controlled by a built-in memory system. You just lead it once through the required motions and it can then repeat them 24 hours a day, week after week. It can position objects to within 50 thousandths of an inch. unaffected by heat, cold, fumes or dust, it could take over a lot of unpleasant jobs. It can operate unattended for 500 hours. 
Originally developed in the States, it's now being made in Britain, and this was its public debut. Have one with me. So what you see here is a machine that can help uh, factory workers uh, by lifting steel plates uh, from A to B. But already then people got really excited about all the possibilities that a robot could possibly um, empower them with, including household tasks or bartending robots. And you will find that these kind of dreams and ideas are still around and are still as close just around the corner as uh, they seem to be have at the time. Now, when you look at the state of the industry, we can look at the annual installations of industrial robots, and you will find that the largest number of robots are installed in the automotive industry. You will also see that they kind of declined from 2018 to 2020. This is not true for all areas, but it's kind of an interesting economic downturn. Uh, that has been temporary now that you look at further out uh, now including to 2022 we are now back to 2018 levels in terms of annual installations what are the applications that we are now seeing in this kind of industrial setting the first one is welding this is what happens in the car industry you have hundreds of uh, robots like this that have um, welders at their tooltip and move and place uh, weld points all over car uh, parts. Of course, the robot is very precise. The car parts are very heavy. They are moved on an automatic gantry um, and the robot can do this uh, basically day and night. Another application that is very interesting is food handling. In this case, you don't have to bring people close to these um, foods that uh, could be contaminated. Uh, and here the robot is simply moving these uh, yellow uh, boxes. There are other industrial robots that can handle donuts and things like this. Another application is foundry, uh, something that is very dull and dangerous um, as well as very hot. So here the robot can approach the um, oven um, in a safe manner without uh, putting um, humans at risk. Now, industrial robots are of course uh, also dangerous and the reason for that is because they are able to maybe lift 50, 60 kilograms or even hundreds of kilograms and they are supposed to do that no matter what. So their motors are very strong and I'm trying to reach the, cert the desired trajectory without uh, caring if there's something in between or not or whether they hold something in their hand or not. So in order to do that they of course just to move forward in an open loop way and if something is in the way uh, it can get very dangerous. So these kind of industrial robots are usually put in cages and the cages are equipped with safety features that when people come close the robot would shut off immediately. There's a new class of robot that has been emerging more recently in the last uh, 10 years, uh, 15 years, uh, which is known as a collaborative robot. And here is the idea that the robot can work together with people. The people can be close to the robot while it moves. And the way uh, the robot accomplishes this, it has a new type of sensor, which is tactile and force sensing. And what it can do is it can sense the force in each of its joints and it can compute the force that it expects based on where it is in space and what it is carrying. And as soon as the force is exceeded that it would expect, the robot would stop. And with that, the robot wouldn't hurt somebody, but uh, immediately stop once an obstacle is hit. Finally, Collaborative robots provide a safe programming environment. That is, when you want to program the robot, you can sit next to it, you can move it around, you can observe its motion, you can fine tune it without going in and out of a cage and holding down safety buttons. So it becomes much, much easier to program the robot. The way these are programmed is still simple keyframing. That is, these are pre-programmed motions 
where you move the robot from a desired location to another. There is no new intelligence in this paradigm. It's really about being able to have force cut off when the tactile sensing exceeds the predicted force. Now the collaborative robot market is supposed to be growing at some really incredible pace. Um, at the time uh, here people thought that you would reach a billion dollars in revenue by 2020. Now we have 2023 so we have new updates and you can see here that we only reached an eighth of uh, that prediction in 2020. But it is now, of course, that we will have this tremendous growth. And right now we are here in 2023. Whether this is going to happen or not is unclear. Um, the actual market share of the collaborative robots is still very small. So you see here that um, only very few of the deployed robotic systems are uh, collaborative. You might argue that the collaborative robot gets some market share from the traditional industrial robots. But what actually happens is, that is my opinion, that collaborative robots often make themselves obsolete. As people buy them to try out something, they are easier to program, they are safe to do so. Then the factory or wherever they are deployed sees that it does work. And then people will ask, well, how do we make this faster? Well, we remove the safety features and put it in a cage, then the robot can move very fast. And they will ask, how can we make it cheaper? Well, we remove all these excess force sensors and things like this. And so the robot only costs a third of the price of the collaborative one. And so what happens a lot of times, um, collaborative robots are used to demonstrate something and then uh, traditional robots are used to implement it. There's a new class of robots, which is called service robots. And that is something that is tremendously growing. And it's a very wide field, especially in warehousing, logistics, in cleaning, and let's say lawn mowing. You see robots that can do these things autonomously. They drive around. There is um, medical applications like working in hospitals, uh, hospitality and hotels, uh, buzzing tables. Uh, I've just seen a robot like this in the United Lounge uh, in Chicago. Um, there's agriculture where the robot collects fruits or does some picking or dispensing of pesticides. And all of these areas are growing. And the most successful of these is probably the Roomba, which was released in 2002. And the Roomba isn't very smart, or it wasn't very smart at the time. It just drives around randomly, but it does eventually cover the entire floor area. It will fill up the dust container. And so people were very happy after deploying their robot. They could see it really did something that they didn't have to do. A big thing for robotics was the acquisition of Kiva Robotics by Amazon. Now Amazon has more than 500,000 robots uh, deployed in their warehouses. And in this case, the Kiva robots are fetching shelves like this, which contain goods, which you can order from Amazon, and they are brought to a picker. And so the picker takes out the goods and puts them into the orders. Now the orders are put into these baskets and sent off to shipping. Now robots are not very good at picking yet, but people are. Uh, but robots are very good at driving around in an environment like this, uh, which is very simple. It's like a chessboard and you see these white dots here are barcodes on the ground where the robots know where they are so they cannot get lost. And it's a very robust system. So the robot is doing what it's best at and the person is doing what it's best at, which is picking things and packaging them in a smart way. And so I think this is really the future, thinking about what can people do, what can robots do, and really use the best of both worlds to increase efficiency and productivity. Autonomous driving also uh, got very far. The first commercial level three car is actually not the Tesla, but was the Mercedes S-Class in 2022, which meets the stringent requirements where in certain situations the driver can turn attention away from the road 
but always must be ready to take full control again. And the system can autonomously control the vehicle on defined routes, so outer routes, uh, highways and things like this. We are still working on level 4 and level 5 autonomy, which is um, where no driver really is needed and the system can drive anywhere under all conditions. Will this ever happen? Probably not. As this technology matures, of course, roads and driving environments will also be retrofit to make autonomous driving easier. Um, and maybe eventually robots couldn't go off-road, but then they are probably not driving on streets. So uh, with this, we get to the frontiers of robotics research. And you all have seen the Boston Dynamics videos. And this one here is the Atlas robot um, moving parcels in a warehouse. And so this works using high torque actuators, high speed sensing, uh, and in particular, high speed computation to implement real time control. Here, the passes are equipped with QR codes that makes it easier for the robot to see them. And it's a semi autonomous setup where a lot of cheating is happening. But now the video also makes fun of itself and shows how things are, can go south uh, very quickly. So the robot has actually zero environmental awareness. It runs into these other things and then it collapses uh, because it has been hitting the table. So what are the things that we need to do more research in? We still have to work on the ability to traverse all terrain access all areas like walking through a forest, uh, climbing a mountain. Um, we are very, very bad still in mobile and in hand manipulation that is moving around and grasping things and then actually moving them around within our hands. Um, roboticists are working on this. It does kind of work, but uh, it's still far away from what a human can do. And finally, we have to increase mobile perception that is localize the robot in its environment, understand uh, what is around it, and then inform its decision making. More recently, you have all been using ChatGPT. We have this advent of uh, large language based models, uh, which provide tremendous opportunity for leveraging common sense knowledge and translating human commands into robotic motions. And this is work done in 2022 by Google. This is the Palm E robot that uses these large language models to perform activities like here. Bring me the green star. It finds this object, it sees that it's green, probably sees that's a star and then grasps that. And then later the robot has to reason about where to get something. Bring me the rice chips from the drawer. So it locates the drawer. It understands that it has to open the drawer. Um, there's now some disturbance happening and realizes that it didn't complete the task. It knows that the drawer is still open, so it exhibits some kind of high level reasoning that has been unusual before. But it also tells you where robotics is at right now. Um, we will see a lot of more results like this in the next few years as these large language models are becoming better and are combined with perception and actuation. So the goal of this class is to provide you with practical experience across the whole mobile manipulation stack. We do have a robot like you just seen. This is actually a Spanish company. You can buy this robot. It is simulated in WeBots um, and a real time simulator. You will map and perceive the environment. Uh, so you will draw a map like the one you see here and you will move in the environment like so. Uh, this uses path planning and you see this little ball is just put there so you see where the next waypoint of the robot is. And we will learn 
basic manipulation. So you will find things uh, like this um, gem jar in the environment and then move the robot arm to grasp it. The way this is organized, uh, we are having three parts, which are each roughly five weeks. So this is a whole university semester of 16 weeks um, with Thanksgiving break or a spring break. And one of these modules is building on top of each other. So we start with basic robotic behaviors and odometry. Then we will learn about robotic mapping and trajectory generation. And finally, we will do path planning on these maps and task execution. At the end, you will create a project where you implement um, a full mobile manipulation stack where the robot is going back and forth between the kitchen uh, counter and the table, um, moving things back and forth. And the whole will be assessed using graded quizzes uh, that you can do on the Coursera platform and peer reviews that are done by the other students and course managers. The grading is results from these uh, graded quizzes uh, that you see in each of the modules, occasional peer reviews, which uh, take the lion's share of the grade that you get, and a final exam, one per part, which essentially asks you a couple of questions on your understanding. You will need to do peer reviews to unlock your achievements. So you won't get graded unless you also submit the peer review. And there will be TAs and course managers who help with the grading and also make sure that grading is done fairly and grades are not too bad and not too good. The total grade for the class will then be averaged over parts one, two, and three. And to give you a complete overview over part one, we essentially have a first lab um, uh, two or three weeks into the class, depending on when you started. So this is the fall um, um, sequence that starts in August. So then in late August, so then three weeks in, we will have lab one. And then uh, two weeks later, we will have lab two, where you start localizing the robot in the environment we are then moving on to part two that culminates in a peer review where you implement mapping and trajectory following. So the robot drives around on a map and then there will be a final lab in part three where you implement task execution using behavior trees and then use all of the before labs to implement a final project. You are welcome to work on these labs in a group so please um, meet with your friends and co co-workers other students to hammer these things out and thoroughly understand them but you will need to submit your own work that is you write your own code you submit it you don't share that with your colleagues you solve quizzes on your own and then you finally show a unique implementation of your final project so these things will be checked against other submissions automatically. So don't uh, download them from the internet. Um, just submit your own work and really try to get it done by working step by step through all the previous labs. There are weekly deadlines on Coursera. The real end dates are given by the hard deadlines that are on Coursera for part one, two and three. Try not to let the work build up, but follow a steady stream of work pattern, uh, which will make you successful. There is a textbook for the entire specialization. It's a book by MIT Press. Uh, we have been writing this at CU for the last 10 years. You can actually download this for free and compile your own uh, version. Uh, this is on GitHub. Uh, it's a LaTeX sources. A lot of the content that is relevant is also in this Coursera class. But if you prefer to skim, uh, flip through the pages, um, download the PDF or get the copy in the bookstore. Now, the material is challenging. And what might happen is that you just get lost. 
and things are too complicated some labs still worked and then the third one or the fourth one is just too difficult and you just don't know where you are we don't want you to struggle and suffer here but we want you to become capable roboticists and the way to do this is to actually engage more and keep working at these little assignments that we provide step by step and you will see you will get it done most of the solutions are in the course videos so if you watch them carefully and you implement things as you go along you have already done the majority of the work what you have to then do is play with the things that you've been given to understand really what's going on and that will allow you to put the final project together and answer the quiz challenges now the course requirements you will need to be able to program in python i really like lead code which has this um, um, graph of uh, different techniques that you need it starts with arrays then you need hash tables you need queues you need heap uh, you need some binary search and i can actually tell you that you will need all of these things in order to be successful in implementing the algorithms that are discussed here and those that you don't implement you will need to understand you might not re need the things to the right here but you will need also to understand what the graph is you might not need dynamic programming but if you are unsure about python programming i encourage you to follow this link and actually go to this um, these tutorials and work yourself through those examples You will also need a good understanding of linear algebra and trigonometry. I do think that robotics actually makes it easy to understand these things because the examples are very tangible. But if you haven't taken a linear algebra bar class um, or a trigonometry analysis class, then this might be the right time to do it in parallel. All right, the labs will use Webots from cyberbotics.com. This is free software. You can download it for free. It runs on Windows. It runs on Linux and Mac. It is very easy to install. And I find it the easiest to use simulator by far. We will talk more about it later in this class and when you do your first labs. Now it's the, a good time to start working on the first assignment, uh, which is a quiz and see whether you still have a recollection of what has been presented.